know, I uh, was really pleased to accept your invitation, and I want to thank you very much for um, having me from. Uh, this is a very important subject at this particular time because uh, of the roots of depression and the roots of um, stress and the cause of loss of productivity in the workplace. And also, outside of that, it is also important for Buddhism itself to demonstrate in this particular um, century, hopefully we'll still be around after this century, um, that Buddhism is something that you can do in life all the time. It is useful in life. And in my experience at home, I realized that um, there is uh, a lot going on for many religions right now with technology happening and how much more young people have information and um, are thinking. I look at them and I, when kids are talking to me like I was talking when I was 16 or 18 and seven or eight years old, <laughs> and I, I was talking earlier to some of you saying, if you don't understand technology, find a nine-year-old and hang out with them, because they can fix everything. <laughs> And um, young people have to identify the value because they, the value of religion in this coming century, because they are flooded with a lot of accurate and inaccurate information at a very young age. And they need to um, be able to say, yes, that's valuable. That can help me in my life. And it's true, not only with Buddhism, it's true with every religion that is supportive for our spiritual development in life. So I'm going to dive right into this. I sort of changed the front of this so it would be a little different for you, but it was all because of you. <laughs> okay. um, one time, I'm going to be talking about suttas when I talk about this, but just bear with me. Uh, I will help you understand the different suttas are the discourses. They are the threads that were the teaching of the Buddha. And sutta, the Pali word, means thread. And so when he taught a discourse, he was teaching one thread to explain what the teaching was each time he was teaching. So you're going to hear me refer to suttas in this talk. And if you have any questions, just jot them down. Please ask questions. Uh, we are going to do this evening this way. We're going to start with this, and then we're going to sit in meditation, a very simple meditation for about 30 minutes so that you can taste what it is that we're doing. And it's a very comfortable practice of meditation. Um, I really believe that St. Francis of Assisi was practicing this way, and that the early Christian monks were practicing this way in the monasteries, that this is what they were doing. So you're going to like it because it has to do uh, with forgiveness, compassion, and love of kindness. And we're going to be doing a loving kindness meditation this time. We did forgiveness when we were at the So this ecumenical talk, I want to start by saying there was once a sutta that was called the Gotamaka Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, that means the book. Um, the, and I'm going to quote to you, this was Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. He's one of our principal translators for um, the Pali texts into English, and one of the best. And it's interesting because this particular piece, it points out a few important things about what Buddha Gautama was teaching. He said that, I teach the Dhamma through direct knowledge, not without a direct knowledge. Second point, he said, I teach the Dhamma with a basis, not without a basis. And third point is, I teach the Dhamma so that it is antidotal, not one without antidotes. The basis for Buddhism is constructed on the Four Noble Truths, which is basically there is suffering, there is a cause, there is a cessation, and there is a path 
were a way to that cessation of suffering. So it's like an examination, it's an investigation of what the Buddha was actually doing with the entire teaching was he was helping people in a sort of behavioral modification program. He was helping people to change. Buddhism is all about change. If you don't want to change, don't get serious about actually coming to find out what he did. Because if you get into what he did, he's going to ask you basically, this is how you can change. And what do I mean change? Change from reacting to responding change from attitudes that lead to war to attitudes that lead towards peace. Learn how to forgive and not take things so personally. To have compassion, and we're going to look at what that means tonight. It's compassion has a special definition. Don't let me off the hook or I don't give you that definition. Okay. And, um, and then loving kindness had a power. It was not just something that you recite and say. It had a power. And it's, loving kindness is interesting because we know now that you can measure the energy of a person uh, with when they're practicing loving kindness and measure the aura um, energy around them. And then when they're practicing loving kindness, we found out that you could measure it out 500 feet from the person. That's and um, some of us didn't believe what happened in Washington, D.C. back in 19, I think it was uh, 1999 or 2000. There were about 300 people in Washington, D.C. who decided to practice loving kindness um, every, it was like two or three times a week. They all got together in one place and practiced loving kindness. At that time, Washington, D.C. was the murder capital of the country. And the murder rate for homicide dropped 35% for the month that they were practicing loving kindness. That's a very significant thing. Okay? So what happened is over time, the loving kindness practice kind of got put into a ceremonial uh, version where we have the children recite it. And it becomes like throat. It becomes like just repeating, uh, may I be happy, may I be happy, may you be happy. You be happy, I be happy, he be happy, this sort of thing. But that might make me feel good that I did it, but that's not discovering the actual power of it. We get into that more later. So, what is direct knowledge? Direct knowledge is knowing by seeing. There was a thing called knowledge and vision, and the basis. Uh, is what the Buddha found, and the Buddha is now trying to show us directly what he did. And so he's trying to do this in a way where you can do it too. And this is the basis of his teaching. And this is the reason that uh, Bhante B. Malaranzi tries so hard, he's my teacher, to stick with the text directly and very closely when we're explaining a sutta until you can get the point where it works for you too in the same way it did for the Buddha, just as it was described in the text. And so that's our only hope of finding it again. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is the closest one so far that has turned up uh, that we like to call it the working translation. That's what we call it in our tradition. Because it's the first time that the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya, there's four books, in the uh, Buddhism, the four basic five books really, but the Kandaka we don't really, it's a collection of books, okay? But uh, there's four books. The Majjhima Nikaya uh, has the whole entire teaching inside of Buddhism. So you can, the whole thing's there. The Samyutta Nikaya, and those are not really, really long, they're middle length sayings. The Samyutta Nikaya, is a book that is set up differently in subject sections. And it has shorter suttas. And those suttas support the Majjhima Nikaya. They agree with them totally. The third one is the, uh, the Digha Nikaya. And the Digha Nikaya has long discourses. The Digha Nikaya is difficult for us to work with. It has some very um, important suttas in it. For certain things, we use pieces of it. But if I was going to teach you a sutta from Digha Nikaya, I would have to have a retreat for seven days. You 
in order to teach you one sutta. So it's different. Whereas the Majima Nikaya, I can teach you a sutta at night in the evening talk for a couple hours. So it's very different. Okay. And then the other one is the numerical book, which is called the Anguja Nikaya, which is probably the foundation for Abhidhamma that happened later. But the Anguja Nikaya is a number system. Of there's one of this and two of this. So I would say to you, the Buddha taught sat, one of the twos would be suffering and the cessation of suffering. And it would be wholesome and unwholesome. And the threes might be dana, um, dana, sila, and bhatma, meaning generosity, morality, and um, development of those. Okay, And then we would have another three, and that one would be sila, Samadhi Kanya, which would be the morality, the, the uh, practice of the calming part of the mind, and then we would have the bhava, uh, the, um, the wisdom that would arise. So these was a way of memorizing things. That's what the Andrew Turner Kaya was. Okay, antidotal here means he's giving you in the text pictures of how the suffering specifically happens, how it operates, but he's not just telling you, hey, this is the suffering, this is the problem. He's also showing you the way out. So he's giving you, um, breaking down the suffering very, very carefully. And this is interesting to me because he actually is the father of um, cognitive science, the father of cognitive psychology. We don't acknowledge the movement that way. But he is the person who has a very complete picture of human cognition. And that's why I, I really can relate to what he's doing. So what is the antidote for suffering? The Buddha is telling us that the cure, the cure to do so that we can let go of the craving, the wanting to hold on to things, and the clinging, which makes this more serious and the habitual reactions, and live with their counterparts of accepting the present as, as it is with loving kindness and compassion, and by responding to our world instead of reacting to it. And this is the path of change. This is what he's talking about, change. This is what he's asking you. Look at the possibility of change in your behavior. Embrace what the teachings are saying. Don't talk about them. Embrace them live them. So he says, since I teach the Dhamma through direct knowledge, not without direct knowledge, since I teach the Dhamma with a basis, not without a basis, since I teach the Dhamma that is antidotal and not one without antidotes, my exhortation should be acted upon, my instructions should be acted upon. It is enough for you to rejoice, enough for you to be elated, enough for you to be joyful, and the Blessed One is perfectly awakened. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, and the Sangha is practicing the good path. He says instead, so here he is just telling us that whenever he explains something, whenever he does that, we are to look for the antidote in what he's teaching, and the cure is to learn and use the dependent origination, the human cognition, by uncovering, to see it in everything, to begin to realize that it is the path to suffering and to the cessation of suffering. When we say the path to suffering, it's the path to understand precisely what the suffering is. That's what I want to help you do tonight. I want you to be able to see on a map of human cognition precisely how you get angry, how do you get sad, how do you have anxiety, how does depression happen. That's what we're going to look at. So here he is just telling us that. And tonight he says, tonight I will try to show you, or this is me, <laughs> I'll try to show you a meditation that will allow you to attain knowledge and vision, which means knowing by seeing, which is the direct knowledge. So it isn't a question of, you know, this is what I say. Don't listen to me. I'm only sitting here as a guide. And my job as a guide if you were coming to a retreat with me, would simply be to ask you five questions each night and to find out exactly where you are and if you're on track or off track so that you could stay on track for seven days and hopefully in that period of time, most of the time this is half
happening now. Uh, you would learn to do what we're going to try tonight well enough that your mind would begin to see that's really more comfortable than it usually is up here. <laughs> I'm usually having to struggle with everything. And all of a sudden, you have an easier way of, of understanding clearly what essentially is happening and not going off track. So this meditation has a basis that is the foundation that we can learn. And the most important thing is this practice is easy to understand. It is immediately effective as an antidote for suffering. And you can keep it with you and you can use it all the time. This is not about showing you something that you have to go to a temple to do. I'm not showing you something you have to be a Buddhist to do. Because the Buddha, in my opinion, came and gave this to all people on earth. He didn't give it to Buddhists. There weren't any until he came. All right. And when he left, he didn't ever even want to have anybody worship him or ever have an image of him. When he left, he told Ananda, take my bowl, his bowl, and turn it upside down. And that's the symbol that you should have for me when I'm gone. This is his baby bowl and turn it upside down. So when you see the pagodas and you see the things that are built like this, this is where the shape came from. Okay, that's how that started. Okay. So I find the Buddhist teaching is the most remarkable examination of the human mind and the true nature of everything that has been uncovered by anyone so far in history. The teaching can be applied to help all human beings to lighten their mind and bring back some of the younger wonderment of life, and a smile once more. It is not a blind faith that I cannot see. It is a living, working teacher, a teaching that I can use to make life easier in the present time each day. And the teaching is a living adventure into how we cognize, where we understand our experience that's in this existence. The Buddha uncovered a process that we know today as the line of human cognition, and it is the same neurocognitive science that we began looking at pretty late in time. We first started looking at neurocognitive science in 1990 in the United States, and we only had a master's degree in it. There was no cognitive psychology. Um, well, the cognitive psychology actually happened first in 1990. This is wrong. No, neurocognitive science started in 1993. Cognitive psychology came in and offered a master's degree program. And it wasn't until later that now they have this as a major that you can actually look at. And in the future, they're actually already talking about dissolving the psychology department in the university structure and putting it into the neuroscience division. They're already discussing. So this is the reason that I came back to Sri Lanka at this time, because of Dr. De Silva and having a chance um, that some others who might want to know what happens medically when we practice this particular meditation, twim. And it's fun that all of us can learn to twim together. <laughs> so do you twim? I twim. <laughs> I don't think that's funny. All right. It's an elder fund for him. All right. We practice this particular meditation approach um, that the Buddha taught to every human being to be of use. And when we fall down in our minds, how can we shift into a happier, lighter, and more wholesome direction? Can we see what happens in the brain, in the blood, in the other systems of the body as things change? And if we can see this, can we then help people to heal faster in the future? And if they have an accident or the disease in their body or their mind, and they're afflicted with a terminal illness with pain, can we teach them how to manage their pain without the use of overdosing and drugs? All of the arahats that were in the room I visited over visa when I went to visit the relics, they had figured out how suffering works, and they had figured out the escape. They learned how to detect the arising cause of it. They experienced a mind without suffering many thousands of times in their practice. And then they finally attained and secured a state of the relief of suffering. 
on the way to their awakening, they learned how to let go of all their stress, all the disturbances in their mind, and establish a state of equanimity and unsurpassed balance in their minds. They achieved a liberation of mind and experienced a state of pure mind, or still point, so that they could reach the highest potential as a human being. This is what the journey was for those monastics. Now, what could that mean for us today? What's the relevance? What is the real potential of our minds? That's the question you've all asked yourselves at some point. What is the potential of the human mind? If we can repeat even some level of what they did, will this change how we live our lives? How would we see our world then, our workplace, our homes, our schools? We need to think about this. Can you imagine not reacting so much in life anymore? You would remain calm and be able to evaluate what is essentially going on and make a decision to respond. There would be no more unessential mental proliferation in your mind based on assumption and pushing you around anymore to react. That's extraordinary. They had an imperturbable mind a mind that could not be disturbed. They could see or hear anything with a calm mind. They were no longer pulled away by lust and greed and attachment, and they no longer felt pushed around by hatred, ill will, or aversion. Now that being so, it means that whatever you are doing in the present time, whatever task it is, you would be able to be here now and look at what is essential and let go of your unessential stories, concepts, assumptions, imaginings, false predictions that color our thinking and mislead us so often. It means it is the end of a runaway thinking, the end of the mental proliferation, and the end of that kind of tension and suffering that we go through. Those who gained attainments of understanding, they were no longer carried away by the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief, or the despair about past events. They were no longer consumed in worries and frightfulness about the future. They were growing what is called equanimity, living with it in the present time, all the time. And that means that our minds had space, a new kind of spaciousness that our minds so often just don't have. They could develop their highest potential with that kind of spaciousness. Is this opening to innovativeness and research, you bet? Does it help researchers to practice this so that they're freer with their thinking? You're right. Does it help children be able to clearly study? Yes, it does. Does it change everything in the workplace with productivity? You bet it does. We can all use some of that. What we do in the workplace has always fascinated me. It always has. I worked as a personnel consultant for 14 years, and I saw many situations where one of the biggest devils that lives in any workplace is named stress. I believe that the tension that drives stress stops our brains from developing to their highest potential more than anything else. What is the stress? How does it develop? What did the Buddha's teaching show us about it? It turns out that when, what, when we do not fully understand how things in life as a human being work, then mind gets caught by a kind of doubt and fear so that it can't develop fully. The mind is just not free. There is a pressure when there is fear, and when we do not understand how things work, there is a subconscious confusion that sits within us. Whenever we don't know how something is broken, we humans get frustrated. We only feel safe 
with knowledge and understanding. So mind gets so busy with all the concerns going on in our life, it sometimes feels like it has a fear that it will never find time to rest. We get exhausted. And the mind and the heart try to take over and run us, but they are innocent. They are only trying to protect us. The mind-heart team is actually attempting to keep the boat afloat and going in a fairly good navigational direction in life, but most often it does not have good navigational information. So to develop to its fullest potential, it becomes clear that mind and the heart must have some relief. They need proper information, so they are allowed to open, to relax from tension, from tightness, to small internally, and to be able to stay in the present time with whatever you are doing. We're not talking about an object of meditation. We're talking about doing the wash. We're talking about building a house. We're talking about driving. We're talking about walking. We're talking about whatever you're doing at work in the present task. That's what we're talking about. I won't ever tell you to try to stay in the present moment. It became a joke at the center. If you look at your watch and look at the second hand, you'll see that it's going, 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 going. So if I were to tell you I'm going to help reduce your tension, please stay in the present moment. Well, <laughs> moment, 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 moment. I can't stay there. No matter what I do, I can't stay in the present moment. But I can ask you to stay in the present time. And that's what the Buddha was trying to do. This is where the Buddha's discoveries come in. This is where they apply to today. This is where the teaching is still priceless. And how you can personally use it, the gift that was left for us, how can we learn to have cessation of suffering in our day-to-day -day life? So I want to talk to you about how it arises how it passes away, how it affects us personally. Why is that a danger for us humans? And how can you learn to personally manage your own escape from tension and stress, resulting emotional states, and some of the causes of the medical problems that happen because of it? Now, here's the good news. There is an escape. And to me, that was like throwing me a lifeline in 2000. For somebody to say, I'll pull you out of this. But he didn't pull me out of it. He only pointed the way. Because that's all he could do. Just point the way. I pulled myself out of it. And it makes perfect sense. This, this escape, the talk is being guided by some information now from the Chichaka Sutta, uh, which is talked about uh, in a way of understanding suffering and reducing the suffering in life. The Chichaka Sutta summarizes for us what we have to understand in order to make this work when you practice. What we're, we're learning to do is we're learning to very quietly watch internally what's happening for us. So we're trying to see where is the stress or the tension, where's the origination of it, where's the disappearance of it. How do we get personally involved in it? How does it get bigger? And the danger of that, and then the escape. So we have these five little pieces. The origination, the disappearance, the gratification, danger, and the escape from various types of arising feelings and emotions that cause suffering. So now what I want to do is basically I want to introduce you to this if you want to follow. What I'd like to do is have a to it for a period of time, and we're going to take the next half hour here, and we're going to actually, this is about 10 minutes long for me to take you through the instructions, and I want you to just sit comfortably in your chair if you just want to kind of sit in a good position, very comfortable. 